The music from The Lost Prince is now on BBC CD and Stephen Polyakov's moving drama is also available on BBC Video and DVD. What I didn't expect was that they should be so deliriously happy and they're scrubbing, well, as you can see, they're scrubbing themselves with it. They're in the seventh heaven. It was a joy to see. I was delighted to bring so much pleasure into their little lives with a bunch of leaves. The Life of Mammals, Wednesday at 9 on BBC One. The News Now on BBC One with Fiona Bruce. Weeks, not months for the weapons inspectors in Iraq, says Tony Blair. He accuses Saddam Hussein of having an elaborate process of concealment. The London tube crash, staff reported problems before it derailed. Hammered in the cup, West Ham go down 6-0 to Manchester United. And on Panorama after the news, saved by modern medicine, house now struggling for help. The story of two remarkable girls and their parents now at breaking point. Good evening. The Prime Minister said today he believes the work of the UN weapons inspectors in Iraq will not be open-ended. Tony Blair said the process should take weeks rather than months. And he joined America in insisting that Saddam Hussein's failure to cooperate would be enough to trigger war. Tomorrow, the weapons inspectors will present a crucial report to the UN Security Council on their progress so far. The weapons inspectors are not being obstructed, but they're not being helped much by Iraq either. As their chiefs head to New York for their crucial report at the UN, now the failure to uncover weapons could be as incriminating as finding them. The Prime Minister is shifting the burden of proof. In a BBC interview this morning, he said that if Saddam Hussein does not actively cooperate and reveal his weapons, then there will be a war. If he fails to cooperate in being honest and he is pursuing a programme of concealment, that is every bit as much a breach as finding, for example, um, a missile or the chemical agent. World business and political leaders meeting amid alpine snow at Davos are not convinced. The American Secretary of State faced hard questions there as he tried to put the case that Saddam Hussein's failure to cooperate is as good a case for war as finding a smoking gun. There are chemical weapons still unaccounted for. Where is this material? What happened to it? It's not a trivial question. We're not talking about aspirin, we're talking about the most deadly things one can imagine that can kill thousands, millions of people. We cannot simply turn away and say, well, never mind. Where is it? Account for it. This week sees a series of diplomatic set-piece events on the road to war. On Monday, the UN hears the first full report from the weapons inspectors. On Tuesday, President Bush will use his annual State of the Union address to threaten Iraq. And the next day, the Security Council will begin a meeting with Britain and America putting the case for war, arguing that Saddam Hussein has not done enough to avoid it. Now, that UN meeting could still be going on when the Prime Minister goes to Camp David for a war summit with the President on Friday. Britain and America may be standing shoulder to shoulder, backed up with the large British military force now preparing to set sail. But as he makes up his mind, Mr Blair knows that opinion polls today show that the case for war has not yet won popular support in Britain. David Loyne, BBC News. Our diplomatic correspondent James Robin is at the United Nations in New York. Ragi Omar is in Baghdad. James, uh, Hans Blix, the head of the UN weapons inspectors, is going to present his crucial report to the UN Security Council tomorrow. What's he likely to say? I think it's clear tonight, Fiona, that Hans Blix will neither totally clear nor utterly condemn Saddam Hussein. Instead, he'll find that Iraq has given some cooperation, but not enough. He'll complain, for instance, about the lack of access to Iraqi scientists. He wants to be able to have interviews with them in private because they may have killer evidence against the regime. So far, he's only been able to have uh, interviews with them with Minders president and that's uh, president and that's found to be very intimidatory so I think it'll be a very mixed bag from Hans Blix but he'll be asking for more time to go on with his search and Raggy King Abdullah of Jordan has said today it will be nothing short of a miracle if war is averted now is that the feeling there in Baghdad 
I think absolutely, and it's been the case certainly with ordinary Iraqis that whatever the toings and froings and negotiations over details in this disarmament process, they certainly feel that war is certain. And um, in fact, this was let on by uh, one of the most senior advisors to the Iraqi leader, Saddam Hussein, who said uh, only 24 hours ago that whatever they did, however much they cooperated in terms of the technicalities of the UN's uh, strictures on Iraq, he felt that war was headed towards the way whatever they did. Well, uh, James, after Hans Bix has presented his report, what next for the Security Council? Well, the Security Council has to wait then for 24 hours to allow the crucial governments around the world in their capitals to consult, to analyse what he's reported before the Security Council resumes on Wednesday to decide what to do next. And this could be very divisive. The Security Council, unanimous, of course, in backing this ultimatum to Saddam Hussein back in November, now deeply divided about what to do next. There'll be pressure on Hans Blix to give a second report within perhaps a few weeks, perhaps by mid-February. And all the time, the rhetoric, I think, will be hotting up on this side of the Atlantic with the United States saying the case for war has been made. In other parts of the world, many arguing that it simply hasn't. The evidence isn't there yet. OK, James Robbins in New York, Raghi Omar in Baghdad. Thank you both very much. Israel has completely sealed off the Palestinian territories until after Tuesday's election. The closure comes after the Israeli army launched its biggest raid for two years on Gaza City in response to a rocket attack on an Israeli town. Gaza ablaze. Under cover of darkness, Israel attacked with tanks and helicopter gunships in a city of over 300,000. Armed Palestinians fighting back gun battles through the night. But they were no match for the Israelis. Civilians, too, caught up in the chaos. At the city hospital, dozens of wounded after Israel's heaviest attack in years. The dead were all men, some known to be fighters. By day, wreckage still smouldering. Israel claims it hit legitimate targets, workshops making mortar bombs and rockets. Adel Shaban shows me what's left of his business. He insists he repaired motor parts here, nothing else. Ten people worked with me, he says. All we can do now is ask for God's help. People here are counting the cost of last night's massive Israeli operation which reached right into the heart of the city. The message here isn't just for the Palestinians. Israel's general election is in two days' time. And all this also says something to the voters. Re-elect Ariel Sharon as prime minister, and there'll be plenty more tough action against the Palestinians. The rage of thousands as they bury the dead. The fear among Palestinians that Israel will hit even harder while the world is focused on Iraq. Orla Guerin, BBC News, Gaza City. A man will appear in court tomorrow charged with possessing articles for terrorist purposes. 29-year-old Samir Asli was arrested after police raided Finsbury Park Mosque in North London last Monday. He was one of seven people arrested in the operation. Staff on London Underground had reported a fault on the tube train that crashed yesterday, but the train derailed just before it was to be taken out of service. 32 people were injured. The line will remain closed throughout tomorrow. Simon Montague reports. The first photos and clear evidence of how the carriages hit the tunnel wall.